welcome to the very first episode of the Workflow Innovation Group's Brilliant or Bust podcast. Today's show is sponsored by Object Matrix, Vidispine, and Zixi. I'm Christy King, the host of this grand adventure. And I'm Nick Pierce, co-founder of WIG and Object Matrix. Thanks for joining us. In this episode, we're going to talk about the conclusions drawn during the recent Devon Croft podcast on the impact of COVID-19 in the media industry. We will then pass judgment on Josh and Joe's conclusions and decide which were brilliant and which are a bust. I'm sure they're quaking in their boots. <laughs> so Nick, the Workflow Innovation Group on LinkedIn has been a bit quiet for a while. What made you decide to reactivate the conversation among us with a podcast series? Are you just missing having a beer with us? Yeah, absolutely. Who wouldn't miss having a face-to-face -face beer with their friends and colleagues from around the world uh, these days? In reality, the industry needs this sort of conversation. There's a lot of digital noise out there at the moment, lots of sales messages. And the reason we started a WIG uh, the Workflow Innovation Group all those years ago in 2010 was to have open conversations with the broadcast tech community for vendors to listen for once, learn from the problems that the broadcast industry is facing and, and build solutions to meet those challenges. So yeah, I'm very excited to get this going. So that makes a ton of sense to me and I'm thrilled to be the host of this podcast. We have an excellent lineup of thinkers. Yeah, some better drinkers than thinkers. <laughs> And I'm excited to hear what they have to say about our current state of affairs in the industry. Absolutely. Let's get this going. Today's brilliant or bus contestants are Nick Pierce of Object Matrix. Hi, Nick. Hello. Steve Sharman of Hackthorne Innovation. Hey, Christy. Grant Nodine of the National Hockey League. Hey, Christy. Ben Davenport of Vidispine. Hi. And Eric Bolton of Zixi. Hello, Christy. Okay, this is how it's going to work. I will show you a conclusion drawn during the Devon Croft discussion about how the impact of COVID is affecting the media technology industry. And it's going to be your job to defend whether you think the statement is spot on and brilliant or dead wrong and a total bust. No sitting on the fence. Our listeners want to find you at the next trade show, if we ever have one again, buy you a beer and tell you how wrong you were. So here's the first one. Media vendors are primarily made up of companies with less than 500 employees, and many of them right now are seeing significant downturn. Many of these companies will also likely find themselves out of business by the end of 2021. Is that brilliant or is it a bust? What do you think, Nick? Um, I think it's, well, I'll, I'll, let's, I'll give you my arguments one way first. Um, <laughs> I, I think that um, given that, um, you know, the Devon Croft and IABM do an annual study showing that the broadcast industry is supported by around 3,000 vendors. And of those, a good two thirds are under the $5 million uh, revenue. Yeah. And so the thought that the majority of those are going to go bust, uh, for me, will scupper this industry that requires small and agile companies. But also, I think we must, we're underestimating the resilience of small companies to survive uh, global issues. Um, yeah. I think, you know, our case in particular, you know, we, what we started out wanting to be a unicorn and through some pretty disastrous times, we've ended up being more of a cockroach, right? <laughs> we'll, we left <laughs> surviving anything. So um, I think there's plenty of small companies there who are agile and small enough to ride this out and also pivot to do the right thing to survive. What say you, Mr. Nodine? So I, I'll, I'm going to say I'm going to say bust, and the reason I'm going to say bust is that uh, ultimately, yes, you've got a lot of small companies that are involved in the broadcast business. Devin Croft will be the first to tell you that consolidation is is something that happens big in our business, and yeah. and frankly, I expect a bunch of those smaller companies will get eaten by larger companies if their uh, if financials become an, an issue in the short term I, I just don't think this this particular prediction is a terribly you know is, is going out on a limb at all really I mean uh, predicting that oh a bunch of economic impacts are going to happen in the ongoing pandemic is not exactly like big crystal ball material um, but I feel like a lot of these companies have evolved in a broadcast business that's about uh, 
you know, long sales cycles and, uh, in, in, you know, increased uh, opportunities for ongoing revenue as a result of support and things like yeah. that. And I think like a lot of these companies are, are actually well positioned to weather the storm. It's not like broadcasters are stopping uh, producing content. I mean, you know, if anything else, I expect the longer this goes, the more creative ways we're going to see to produce the content gets produced. What do you have to say about that, Steve? But I suspect it's going to going to depend very much on the the actual type of the company. So I I, I would imagine that um, services companies um, are likely to find um, uh, find it quite hard um, in the downturn because um, because that's going to depend on um, on project work. It's you know it, we may get upturns in certain things because you you bring people in to make rapid change to deal with the um, the current situation, but um, but usually discretionary spend around say consultancy or, um, or or professional services is one of the first things to drop out of the bottom whereas i think you your point around around if you're selling products you still you you can cut yourself down to to the point where you can probably you know you're not flying to trade shows you're um, you you you're, you may be dropping some of your r&d spend you can probably pivot into the next point lasts quite a long time as a cockroach um, off some of your um, your, your your ongoing support revenues um, to come out the um, to come out the other other side of this the whole industry is made up of, of a bunch of tiny little companies and if a bunch of tiny little companies die you'll probably see a bunch of other tiny little companies just re-emerge with the, some of the same people some of the new people um, and, uh, and 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 actually it'll not go back to normal because I think it's a different normal but um, but but the dynamic and the and the dynamism in the industry, I think, will still be there. Tell me, I'm wrong. So, no, I think you got two really strong points there. I mean, one is if you're an established vendor in the industry that's been around for a while, you're likely to have fifty percent plus of your revenues coming from maintenance contracts and and if you're a mission critical product or mission critical anywhere in the supply chain yeah. who's going to cancel that contract at this time you know so, so that's you've probably got some solid revenue and, and and companies might have to resize for that business the other thing that josh said in in the podcast was we will see a reduction in the number of vendors in the industry for a while and and i agree with your point again there steve it's i, I don't think that's true for every every company that doesn't survive the next couple of years there'll be a new one that comes through because people will continue to innovate and i think that the the last point i'd make is that uh, josh made a really interesting and, and, and valid point that, that a lot of media companies are not not buying equipment or not investing in technology unless they can see an roi in less than the next financial period or 12 months yeah. and and uh, i i think that's a really valid point but how many of us uh, as vendors aren't aren't already looking at how we provide solutions that do that um, and, and making sure that the ROI on the solutions we provide is really clear. Um, and of course, when you, you're talking about cloud deployments and, and mm -hmm. agile deployments and other things, that ROI becomes much quicker to realize anyway. Um, so yeah, I, I, think, I think the question is definitely a bust, um, but you could tweak it slightly to make it brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> So, so we need to to read Castle Podcasters uh, on the fence. The media <laughs> on the fence, <laughs> and in listening to the comments of you folks, I can hear an awful lot of capex versus opex. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I we're a software defined video platform. We're software in that way, and I think that the industry itself has been trying to migrate towards virtualized cloud based workflow, term based models, SaaS models, everything that you're going to need to do. Um, I completely agree that it's always been a small ecosystem of, in terms of the size of the companies, but people don't leave it. There's very specific skill sets. And if anything, the, our, our baseline clients of the big media companies and the service providers that go into them and all the OEM manufacturers, everybody's just in a faster migration. And there's always a reasonable attrition rate. I don't think it gets any higher. I think the attrition rate kind of sticks where it is. And you'll watch how many of our people do we know have been reinvented multi-company to gone through things. I do think there will be consolidation, but I think there's also massive consolidation on the client side. And I think the business models just got greatly accelerated. I think that the way that people now have to adopt term model, SaaS model, containerized mm -hmm. model, all of those different pieces mean that you've got a lot more ways um, to monetize what it is you're selling in the solution. And then the final ROI thing, yeah, but we're the, being held to an ROI standard that everybody has to meet. You have to meet it right away. The mm. problem with that, and I think it's a, a bit of a problem with the report, is it's very US-centric with a little bit of UK thrown in, right? And 
we work a lot in Latin America where OPEX just doesn't fly at all. You know, if they want, if you want to do a subscription deal in Latin America, they ask you for the, the price for five years of subscription and they'll pay you up front. <laughs> right? So it's, um, well, then you, now you're in a packaging game, right? We, you know, you're right. Game, but ultimately, you know, those models are being adopted yeah. in sort of um, in the U S and, and maybe across Europe. Now, CapEx is still king in many parts of the world. So I think, you know, it, I think the report, obviously, for me, is very US centric. I also wonder, will some of the big companies survive? I think there's more danger of some of the big companies going away <coughs> or than the smaller ones. You know, um, companies that get sold off after being invested in because they weren't making their money. We won't name them. I think Josh did a couple of times. You know, there, there are those companies that struggle to find their feet in the last 10 years and will struggle mm -hmm. again. So I think. For me, the smaller companies and the more agile companies will survive. Have a better chance of surviving or, or re-emerging than some of the bigger ones. I think you're right. The middle is a, the, the middle's dangerous to be in. Um, sort of being very, very big is kind of um, it, it, it gives you access to to financial markets. Very, being very small gives you agility. Being medium probably is quite dangerous. And when you actually look at um, you, you look at the size of our industry and and you know and even the you know the revenues of some of the biggest players in our uh, our business are, are the same revenues as a as a relatively small um, software company in the um, in the wider world. There's been some terrible stuff this year, um, and yeah, you know, and the cost in terms of you know human life and um, and economic devastation is is something you just can't get away from. You know, if, if there's a positive coming out of it in our industry, all the stuff that for years we've been told doesn't work you can't do it that way you can't remote can't do stuff in the cloud we've we've proved that that's bullshit in one six month period um and um and i'd like to say we're never going back on that and i think that in many ways actually opens things up incredibly into a, into an incredibly interesting place going forward so what do you think or bust down bust thumbs down bust. it's a bust <laughs> Okay, the vote is in. Sucks to be you, Devin Croft. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the next one. OTT cannot replace broadcast dollars. Brilliant or bust? What say you, Eric? If you define broadcast dollars as traditional over the air cable upfront spend, which is globally around 250 billion, North America around 70 billion. Um, and there was always the fear of you know, internet dimes for broadcast dollars. Mm. I think that one, to Grant's point, it's a brilliantly opaquely worded question, which leads you into a separate conundrum, which is that Nielsen and the entire industry has to protect that dollar base. And they're going to migrate that so slowly that it's impossible when there's almost no one watching broadcast television relative to the dollars they charge and the cord cutting, cord numbers, et cetera. But OTT, and, you know, we're right in the heart of the live streaming. I am seeing that QOE, like 4K UHD broadcasts are bringing in 3X, 5X, 10X on the spot rates. All of this virtualization that's going to happen and all of the consolidation of these big media companies, Peacocks, HBO Max, Disney Plus, all of that, they're going to get hyper-targeted in their programming, in their ads, and they're going to jack spot rates. And as soon as those rates and those dollars get towards equilibrium, they'll cut. I think you're right now at about 25 billion in digital versus the 70 if you wanted to compare. Mm -hmm. So you don't make that cut anytime soon. You long tail the revenue. Over time, that's where the audience is. And they're going to go full mobile and 5G will be different. And we're doing those trials. You know, if you've got a 100 meg 8K thing going to a theater, I don't know what ads are worth. They're worth a lot. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's, is it going to happen? It has to happen because it's existential to the industry and the public companies. Yeah, yeah, but I, I think talk. it's largely the impetus for it happening is largely external to the media business. It's sophistication of the ad buying public has to kind of be brought to a, a, a level where the desire for those more targeted spots that you would get delivering OTT content is high enough to offset the broadcast dollars that an organization like ours is getting um for licensing our content i would add to that the ad tech industry is very ripe for some disruption and it's a big interoperable 
mass that has it itself is, is going through things like vast networks and vast tags have to do all those parts mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. where you slot in on the scuddies. But I do think that it's going to be an ish and that the lawyers will find ways like right now you're a little stuck with digital carve out rights. But also, you think about COVID and pandemic, you got to chase your consumer who's now holed up in a house and you're going to have to get to them on a streaming platform to make the message. And you're going to need to rise above everybody clamoring to remember to buy your stuff. What do you have to say about that, Steve? The industry, I think, is a little bit insular. It's making this assumption that it's kind of going from one place to another, whereas the, the, it looks like the real danger is actually the ad revenue is um, is is kind of soaking away from the 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 the, the, the media platform as a as a whole. If we're not careful, because it uh, it's being sucked into the um, to Google and Facebook and the um, and and you know and the, those and those pure kind of social platforms. As a parent, um, watching my kids and their behaviour, because I mean, ultimately, we're five reasonably middle aged men. <laughs> talking about the problems of broadcast technology but it's the consumer that's driving this as eric said so mm. um and, you know my kids coming through they love netflix because there's no ads they and therefore the ads have to be a lot more targeted and clever and, and you know not sort of buy me buy me as eric was saying um you know we do watch the catch-up services and everyone goes off and makes a cup of tea or gets a drink when the ads are on <laughs> so mm. um i think the ad the ad the whole ad scene is is in a bit of trouble anyway but ultimately, they will find a way of broadcasting ads to us or targeting us with, with that sort of stuff, whether it's on linear or OTT or any platform, because there is money to be made and someone will be smart enough to come up with a way of ensuring it happens. Well, and think about the kind of things that, that gentlemen of our age buy, right? I mean, we're not exactly, uh, we're not exactly prone to impulse <laughs> purchases that aren't like food items. <laughs> Pizza reference. You know, like, <laughs> you can always get me with the, like, hey, there's a big stack of quacks over in the corner, right? But, um, but you know, getting me with, uh, hey, uh, buy this, you know, grill because it's better than the other one you have, that never happens because I've already done, like, 17 hours of independent research about which grill I want to buy, right? Because you don't, because like when we're buying stuff, we buy things in a different way than you do when you're 20 something, right? Your thoughts, Mr. Davenport? I disagree. I think ads do work, that they're proven to, you can, you can see the results. And, and I think, um, uh, yeah, I think it kind of contradict Grant a bit. And where we start researching things like grills or uh, new cars or whatever you know we we are touched by by stuff in that journey that we we probably don't acknowledge but it's it's a it's you know it's it's an interesting um segment has uh advertising been affected massively i i i think yeah. that the tricky thing in this statement is is broadcast versus ott well I, I mean i tend to define broadcast as anything that goes from one people to many you could call that linear if you like whether it's streamed or not it's it's not going away um and and revenues on that will pick up, but they will have to be smarter. Um, I think what's happened during the pandemic has been fascinating in, in terms of how um, broadcasters have tried to replace some of the the revenue they've lost, especially from sports events and things. There's a fascinating article in one of the UK newspapers, I think, about uh, what what the ITV and broadcasters have done here in terms of finding new advertisers, and that that some companies that never would have done linear advertising or, or tv advertising suddenly have had the opportunity because rates have been dropping that much mm. um and they're suddenly seeing you know the effectiveness of 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 broadcast advertising it does have a place as does targeted ads and i, and I think that's all about the customer journey where they are in, in, in the journey the one thing that remains with linear television uh from from an advertising point of view is it's brand safe you can you can pick the spots that you're advertising on you, you know that you're not going to suddenly um, find yourself advertising bars of soap in a in a horror movie about people being slaughtered in the shower kind of thing. That brand safe environment is still valid. That said, uh, I also totally agree. That there is a bit of a shake up in in the way that we apply technology in that industry, even when it comes to linear, where there's still a massive spend on advertising and and really applying some of the techniques that are used in digital um, advertising, you know, and being able to control things like reach and frequency, and um, certainly on second tier channels, is really really interesting. I believe that the distinction between broadcast and OTT is useless at this point, and and there's yeah. no point in distinguishing. It's all it's all revenue that you should be optimizing 
in whatever mix is appropriate. OTT can't replace broadcast dollars. Or... It's a fast. Fast. Does Josh get a uh, does Josh does Josh get a right to reply on these? I tell a story. A few years ago, I was in San Diego, um, I think ahead of an HPA retreat or something, and uh, and uh, I told Josh that I was heading down that way, and he said, "Oh, we'll meet. We'll have breakfast." And and he stood me up, um, <laughs> and uh, and he he knows it. Um, so until he pays me that breakfast, I'm, he he gets no right to reply. We should do a breakfast with Josh, and 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 that will be his right to reply. I guess we need to all disclose if we have any unpaid or unchecked accounts payable or receivable with Josh, <laughs> with Josh. <laughs> or Joe, Joe or Josh. I Either think one. the one thing we uh, I I can certainly say is that uh, I I think the work they do is brilliant. Um, and yeah. the podcast they did. You know, they try to have contrary views and the, 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 the statements that we pick from it, um, you know, it, it's, it's testament to the podcast they did. But, um, yeah, didn't, didn't agree with a lot of it, as we'll find out. But I think the work they do is, is brilliant. I've always enjoyed it. Yeah. This is uh, the industry needs more of an opportunity to, to talk to itself. Conversations of the, that have a bit of opinion and, um, and disagreement and debate in them, because I think the um, I think we're, we're probably all bored to death with um, with webinars. To me, that was the most fun. The, the pre NAB pre IBC industry, just getting a finance look was like yeah. it was kind of the highlight of the show. Honestly, yep. <laughs> absolutely. All right, let's dive into statement number three. COVID will force a massive change in the baseline technology infrastructure of the entire media technology industry for everyone. Brilliant or bust? Steve? To a certain extent, that's a, um, that's a, uh, that's a duh, but, um, but actually to, um, to Nick's point earlier, um, it, it isn't. As one of my old bosses um, loves to tell me, there's still a huge amount of the television world that, um, that runs on, um, on SD infrastructures and SD advertising and makes a lot of money out of it. There's a great debate going on between, uh, I think, Joe and Josh talking about the, the, the stations with the, um, the the 30 year old equipment. That's partly because it's expensive to replace and B, it works and it works for them. And they're telling stories off the back of it. And the content in the story is, um, is, is the important thing. And that is probably a massively heretical thing for somebody like me to say, who's supposed to be a technologist. Well, but they're also their point was in the middle of that argument that was so good is that it worked until February. Not everything, the new infrastructure, whatever you want to call that, whether it's um, public cloud, private or whatever, is not for everyone. Um, sound like a complete Luddite saying that. And then, in, you know, I don't need your fancy wheel. Take it away. I'm quite happy with what I'm doing. But um, also this period where you did have those people with that infrastructure, you know, sending their staff into buildings in PPE gear to make infrastructure work, you know, getting them to use some form of transport. Um, those people, and there's lots of companies who are still way behind the curve when it comes to taking on this new IP world. And obviously those who are, you know, if you listen to the DPP archive, uh, Future of Archive report that we took part in, there are the companies that were really well established, like A&E Networks, and, you know, and the, and the work that you and sort of Sinead have done when, uh, when, when you were at UK TV is all very much cloud first, right? And so they were ahead of yeah. the curve. But then your PBSs of the world are a little bit behind and trying to catch up and going cloud wood. And they're, they're the people who are going to be looking at more sort of hybrid environments. And there'll be people who can't just switch over to this new fabric just because of the pandemic. Um, but I do think that um, budgets will maybe now become available to help them do that, to help people work remotely, to help stuff happen um, that maybe wasn't there this time last year. Mr. Nodeen? I like the statement. I just think it's too equivocal. Like, yeah. uh, it, it, you know, like force, is COVID going to force this? No, it's not going to force it, but it's certainly going to entice people that are looking to be adaptable and to, and to adapt technology to solving the unique challenges of dealing with COVID-19 um, and, and their unique per business, right? Uh, ultimately, sure, it's going to push lots more people further down that road than they would be otherwise. Mm. But it, I, I still think that the statement is just a little bit too uh, over the top and saying this is going to force everyone to do this because I don't see that. Ben? Stepping back from the remote working and, and cloud and, and all of those things, one one thing that, that 
that Josh says repeatedly in, in, in all the podcasts actually is we're going to have to have a serious conversation. <laughs> and, um, and, and I think some of that serious conversation is about, it's, it's not necessarily about the technology we buy and sell, but it's about how we buy and sell that as a result of this change. Um, the budgets could or should actually increase. I, I think there's it's more about making sure that the equipment that we sell as a vendor or that the services you provide as a, as a service provider of any sort, that the value's there and you understand the intent investment, but you also understand the return. And I don't, I don't think we've ever really proven that as an industry. Um, you know, we're getting to the point where we have cost-aware APIs and we're able to almost... Um, kind of nail down the the cost of processing a piece of content and and the revenue that we can generate from that, et cetera. So we, you know, we're getting to the point where we can almost um, track that end to end, and it's it's a monumental task to do so. But I think once we start thinking in that way, budgets might well in- increase. And is that a change that is happening because of COVID? No. Is it a change that I think we were starting to see anyway? Yes, is COVID going to accelerate that change? Undoubtedly. And once that becomes a trend, I think longer term, we could see that arguably 2020 has has forced or accelerated or or got the industry to kind of turn a corner on that. People have rushed into technology because of the pandemic that they will regret in six or 12 months time because they thought they had to do something. You know, not everyone's got brilliant engineering teams with the likes of Steve or Grant in them, right? They, they, you know, they, they've been advised they must do it because the, the trend is telling them to do something. And then all of a sudden, the trend has made them get into something that they, if they find difficult to get out of in six or 12 months time, once things return to whatever normal is. So, but, but do they, I mean, is, is that really a pro- I mean, maybe there are places that's a problem, but I think, for instance, one thing um, that there's been no time for is customization. I mean, uh, how many times, Nick, have you had a conversation with um, a large, let's call it traditional broadcaster, where they must have a certain integration or a type, or that they need to have a user interface that works a certain way? Um, and there's been no time for those these sort of things to be developed in technology deployments this year if they were going to be going to productive. You know, things have had to be much more standardized and that kind of standardized, commoditized approach. You could do a lot more if, if you if you don't have those kind of customized little touches. And I think that's one lesson that we will certainly get out of this. I, I would say, and I think this is interesting, you know, to hear you guys with more European, UK perspectives. COVID, everybody was virtualizing. They're all going down this path. And we're all in agreement. It was just a major accelerator and a forced accelerator at that point. And then it has a, an impact on how we produce. It took things like production technologies, live production in, in my particular world, and overnight had to throw them into an area that they didn't want. They wanted to be in a control room. They want to be on premise. They want to have their director, producer, graphics operator watching and doing this stuff. You got to run news. You got to run sports. But all of a sudden, where maybe 5% of the people were working remotely and 95 on-prem, that's now got flipped overnight by necessity. And even though you may have Band-Aid tools in Zoom, like we're on right now, other things are already being added and they're evolving. And the fact that you can do it, you still have a secondary problem in that the COVID, while we wanted to say, we'll evolve again, nobody knows what, is it a year out, whatever, is it gonna be second waves? You've got a twofold thing there. It's impacting the way people can get into buildings, do things, get up an elevator, access a place, Grant and I are talking, when's Grant gonna, and the NHL gonna be in Hudson Yards? That's a TBD. Um, when am I, I've got an office in, in New York, and when am I gonna be there? TBD. And then you have the actual driver on the consumer side. When can, when can humans gather in mass to consume things, uh, whether it is a sport or a concert or event or something? So all of that is on a time horizon that's, that's not totally out of whack where we were heading anyways, and then, at least us, and I'm not entirely sure on the full European Asian impact, but I know it's country by country. In the middle of this, you've got C-band and 5G rolling out, satellites coming down. So even if you wanted to hang on to your old model, you're running out of runway. By mid-year next year, you're missing birds. So whether you wanted to hold on to that SDI long tail traffic, you're going to be forced into some IP terrestrial, and you're not riding that. That's not on a fiber-based world. That's not on a box-based world. That's going to be a virtualized world because the only way to actually get there under the timelines being laid out, you're going to have some mandated stuff. And again, I think it's accelerated, but I think it's a little more permanent because once you get there, I don't know what you're you're going back to. 
You guys alluded to it several times, and I think they're very, these two statements are very much intertwined. And that is, in 2021, we will see even higher tech budgets from buyers than we did this year. Is it not a, 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 a given that budgets will actually be higher next year, not lower? And, you know, as, as the guys alluded to, as Josh and that alluded to on the podcast, yeah, I think that people are going to have to be spending bigger budgets, but will they be available? So from our perspective, um, you know, trying to sell disaster recovery and business continuity, even to some broadcasters where, you know, for them, that was an LTO on a, on a drive, on a, mm-hmm. on a shelf somewhere. You know, the infrastructure um, investment plan for that, for a more private cloud, was on row Z of, uh, that's Z, not Z, row Z of... Um, <laughs> Uh, of the uh, of the investment spreadsheet, and I think that's come shooting right up now. And that the ability to put in good BCP and DR is a must, and so money will need to be found for it because there will be some sort of insurance um, requirement for a business to ensure they can keep producing and keep working when things go south again. But yeah, I think that those budgets will be bigger. I think people will spend on more infrastructure and services that they weren't planning on doing so in 20, 2020 or twenty twenty one. Key question, I think, or the key question for me is where's the money coming from? I'm working within a sector that's um, aviation connectivity and um, and content on aeroplanes. It's bad out there. Um, you know, there, there are not a lot of things flying in the skies um, right now, apart from um, Amazon fl- flights um, shoveling our parcels around. If if this carries on for a while, will there be the co- you know will there actually be the content and the sport and uh, and so on there for people to kind of want to consume to generate the dollars that we need to spend? Ultimately, I think the money has to come from somewhere. Where it comes from, uh, you know, it, you're, you're certainly going to be uh, doing the proverbial robbing Peter to pay Paul for the next uh, year or so. I mean, uh, the bottom line is, is that for sports leagues, not having fans in arenas is a huge, you know, it's a huge issue. And, you know, it's going to be difficult until that's, until that's resolved. It's, it's going to be difficult to find dollars and uh but the realm of things that you know that you need to pay for in a pandemic environment is larger than it was beforehand i'm very glad not to be a finance person right now Mm. the uk has suddenly gone from uh, from from worrying about spending what 30 30 billion borrowing 30 billion a year to to do stuff to um, like borrowing half a you know half a trillion pounds um, is is kind of not off the table this um, this this year, um, and that and and we seem to kind of not the, the world doesn't seem to be worried about that. I mean, I've heard, heard people that um, you know in private equity and so on, they haven't got a home for this money to go to. Uh, it's um, you know, will will people kind of drop money into um, entertainment into entertainment because you know that's kind of all we can do for a while. So don't watch it. I don't know. Uh, we, we're sort of talking about our little bubble, aren't we? Of yeah, uh, our little bubble of, of broadcast and, and Eric. Um, certainly we've had some good conversations about there's going to be an awful lot of people out there without jobs soon <laughs> and are they going to want to spend their um, their seven dollars 99 a month on 17 new services or are they want to be able, are they going to be able to buy stuff um, and for, that's been targeted to them for advertising so that money has to come from the consumer at the end of the day somehow yeah. from advertising or for subscriptions and the bigger social economic picture is, are people going to be doing that in 2021? I mean, we're not going to answer that here, but I think it's just, a, you know, we are in this bubble talking about where is our money going to come from? But inevitably, it comes from outside, right? It comes from the end users. Well, I, I, well, I would say to, say to that, you know, and you, you have to touch on it that uh, without going too down, far down in the iceberg, that what we're saying, this COVID, it, it, it's a multifaceted impact, you know, and whether people like it or not, and it's... Yeah going to absolutely impact how Main Street is dealing with this. Uh, we know there's companies in job loss and that affects income. We do know historically that television uh, goes up in good times and goes up in bad times. So, you know, people are still going to go down and make sure they have a beer, a bottle of wine and something. If, li- if life's going sideways, they'll be clinging to that uh, entertainment life raft pretty closely. Mm-hmm. I think that from our side, I think the numbers do go up. The actual way you made television, you always had news over here and sports over there and general linear programming and the cable guys were over here and the OTA and all of that is collapsible. The mighty sports, small mighty news become a single group. And 
And the key is you can do these organizational, functional, operational collapses when you virtualize. Sadly, do the same work with less people, or you're probably going to be doing more work with slightly less people creating even more product or more content to compete because you're going to now have to have differentiated products in the market. So I see that there'll be that money spent next year is to existentially morph. Our business model of the industry sat still for about 60, 70 years. And now this is not about how do you evolve? This is existentially, how do you survive? And there'll, and there'll be consolidation all around, you know? Yeah. Don't be surprised when you watch Apple come in and pick up Disney and you have an Apple with mouse ears. Yeah. <laughs> I think one of the um, statements they did make on the podcast, which is true, is that, that CFOs are looking at any, any dollar spent has to bring $2 in savings, right? And I think that it's gonna be the people that do help to bring operational efficiencies who do help that virtualization and, and that sort of consolidation are probably going to win out of this a little bit in terms of getting their hands on that budget. Brilliant or bust, whether massive technology is about to be forced or dead wrong and a total bust. Oh, this is a- I'm going to say yes. You're going brilliant. I, think, I, I say boom, brilliant. I'll say it's, it's a true statement. I was going to be wishy-washy on this. We all want to do this, but we weren't allowed, according to the Welsh rules. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, doing it wrong. I'm going to say bust, because it hasn't been forced. Bust. bust. Well, we've, not, we've not done brilliant yet. Okay, good job. Way to follow directions. That was Europe versus the USA right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, have you seen how we've handled COVID? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Brilliant. Yet. I'm sure we can all have that story. Anyway, next. Okay, this one. So part two, are we going to have higher budgets next year? Or? Brilliant. Brilliant. I hope so. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Really? Okay, then. I'm always happy when I see the NHL going thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> Our one buyer says, yes, bigger budgets. Oh, I'm voting already on this one. <laughs> <laughs> Quick, Hold unless... on. I got to get this out of my mouth. Hold on. on Big booths at trade shows are now over because they're entirely unnecessary. So, Brilliant so... or bust? But I, I think it's obvious. I mean, it, it, trade shows have been trending downward in terms of um, attendance. Um, that isn't always a bad thing. You know, we talk a lot about, okay, numbers are down, but quality's up. Um, and uh, and that is good. We definitely need forums to to meet in person. That's that's not a question. The networking at trade shows is hugely valuable. My yeah. my genuine hope is that that this is a a real chance for um, exhibitors, visitors, and the show organizers to really just hit a reset button and really think about why we do these things. And I think that was a a, a, a comment that Josh made too. Me, 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 go, me, go, you. me, me. <laughs> Oh, man. I think trade shows are good for the way you get the opportunity to meet people, right? And so, um, you know, I met Grant at NAB, but it wasn't on the trade show floor. It was through a connection that we both know, another another Tafia member. And, you know, <laughs> had a, had we'd both not been in Vegas, we'd have, we'd have never met and started, a, you know, what's grown into being a really nice friendship. Um, but the point being is that that could have happened at the SVG event, right? Or it could have happened at Devoncroft. For me, trade shows have become a bit like going to a rave where you get drunk and you might kiss a couple of people and you might form a relationship with one of them sometime, right? You're going to bump into loads of people. Uh, there's, there's no, you know, there's no way, real way of forming. Stop with all your funny looking faces. <laughs> That's a vision of you in a field outside Cardiff in the 1990s. <laughs> <laughs> If, not, if, I mean, if we need a rave, I saw him with the glow stick running around without clothes. I'll send you. I'm seeing, you I'm seeing a, a Nick wearing a Nebworth T-shirt, kissing everyone, everyone. Yeah, anyway, <laughs> let's, not put, let's not put out there that I may have you know, tried to do that at a rave. I'm just talking about it could be like that. <laughs> it's. Um, I think the point being is a lot of energy and money for very few good leads, right? So. We as a company, yeah, we're small. Our revenues aren't massive compared to some, you know, we're, we're definitely in the, 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 um, the sort of the two thirds of the 3,000, if you like, in terms of revenue. And we spend about 160,000 pounds a year on different trade shows. And then if you look at the leads you collect over that time, you might get 400 new leads a year, of which 10% are probably real, of which 10% have budget. 
But then if you think about the money we've invested in things like SVG, DPP, right, um, attending the HPA events, more focused, more community-based, smaller groups where you can build relationships. Trade shows are dead as they are today, and we won't be taking a stand at IBC or NAB next year because that is just laughable that they'll go ahead. I was going to say, so it's a moot point, surely. There isn't, there, there will not be big trade shows next year. I mean, they're, they're, they are kidding themselves, really. I mean, it, it would... Right, Grant, are you going to send staff to a trade show, right, in, in reality? I, I wouldn't send anybody if I wouldn't go myself, and I wouldn't go myself, so. Yeah. There's a couple of things here. One, you went there to, I don't know if it was full leads, but track projects, because as we've all known, sales cycles are forever. And you're like having your biannual check-in. I need to be at NAB in April and I need to be at IBC. In I mean, this is the first time in 21 years I was not in Amsterdam in September. And I missed my Le Chouf here. That was a tragic thing. And I managed to find it down here in Patagonia. But the question says, are they unnecessary? And they are very expensive. They were, they were also tracking like clients, kind of weird from a vendor perspective, your booth size and year on year increase and position all had a status and a pedigree and you would be assessed on how you were performing based on that. Like it's a we Zixi were ready to have our a 40 by 40 double decker booth. This was gonna be, you know, coming out, NAB, hurrah. And instead, no. How much money do all those things cost? It's insane. So if the paradigm shifts so that clients and and aren't judging you on that factor. Well, then that's going to be a big deal. And I do think that it's also less whether they're unnecessary and more to what you just said to Grant, are they possible? How is any IBC going to happen in September? And NAB, we're going to fly right back in October and we're going to say, we don't want to have national super spreader events. We want to have international super spreader yeah. events just to make sure everybody, I mean, you're still, we're not out of the window. I think the point is, is that once this is over, I think, like Ben said, it's, it's a reset, right? I mean. The whole thing about Amsterdam and the length of five days, and it's well known that I think trade shows should be three days max, is that they said, well, we can't because it's all booked. And then it's this big tie-in between the city of Amsterdam and the IBC yeah, yeah. and all the other bodies and all the cell, all that sort of vested interests. Well, this has blown that out of the water. Finally, those organizations are going to have to listen to their customers, which is us, the vendors, and, and what works for us. Guys, we've, you know, where your customers stop. So, so what like, takes its place? Do you, do you see already? Do you have a sense of what? Because, you know, as you've seen since February, we've seen a million webinars. We've seen panels. We People are starting to do podcasts. They're starting to be these other methodologies. Do you, do you feel like, have you guys seen anything that sticks out as the winner? Something that we'll become a lot more of? Or do you feel like it's still really in flux and we're all still trying to I don't think it it's out? necessarily a winner. When it comes down to it, you know, why do people go to, to trade shows? Well, we go we, we go to, to, to meet each other. That's kind of been my primary reason to go to, to, to trade shows for 20 years. Um, and we go to, to, to kind of pick up quality intel about where the industry is going. You know, when you've got an event like the... Um, like the sort of the, the the DPP leaders event, you know, you can see, you can sit and listen to the key key spenders in the the UK broadcast marketplace talk about what they like, what they don't like, what they where they're going. Um, that's kind of f far more valuable to to you as um, I think as a, either a vendor or a um, or, or or a kind of a partner to have that kind of quality than it is to to, to have the the sort of the quantity of the trade show. One of the things I really like going to is the Devoncroft Summit. Yeah, I, absolutely. Devoncroft DPP leaders. Leaders, the SVG chair uh, chair summit in New York, and, and those things they're people based, they're community based, and they're curated. They're, it's curated content too. You've got yeah, somebody who yeah. knows what the heck they're doing, running the <clears> show, and picking content featuring people that actually have something of value to the rest of us. You know that curation level seems like something that probably will get more popular because we all there's nobody that doesn't want desperately to get into the Devoncroft event. Um, and, hmm. and I think it's because of that curated content. Yeah, so maybe yeah. that's what will come out. Well, well, because, uh, because vendors well, are getting yeah, an yeah. introduction to people yeah. that, that is a valuable thing that you're not getting from a trade show. Yeah. You don't get, NAB is not going and handholding a bunch of people and introducing them directly to you. They're just saying, they're all out there. Have at them. I, having been on both sides of the trade show floor, both as a buyer and a seller, 
the thing that's always driven me crazy about trade shows is that most of the time, salespeople and sales engineers are, are typically banned from speaking, banned from getting on panels and banned. And be, but those are the folks that have the widest set of experiences across the most people, whether they're my competitors or they're my colleagues. Salespeople are the people that talk to everybody, that hear everybody's problems, that have a wider sense of what's happening in the moment in my industry. And so I've always found it bizarre that any kind of curated, you know, small or a large event um, where there's a trade show floor and sales, that those guys are all kind of stuck over there in the corner. And then we're all inside talking to each other. And then we're allowed to go to the sales floor and actually hear from everybody and what's going on across the industry. So I think there's that, I, I keep coming back to that idea of if you have some folks that really know how to curate content and curate speakers, there's got to be a better way to start bringing those folks that are really talking to people all the time across the industry and involve salespeople as part of the conversation. In a setting like NAB, it's impossible to find a room full of salespeople that where at least half of them are not completely and utterly full of shit. <laughs> I thought you were going to say hungover. I go with hungover. Not I wasn't ready. I didn't know which punchline was coming out, but I should have <laughs> I miss the serendipity of the trade show a little bit and, uh, and sort of happening on things that um, you wouldn't normally fall across. But the um, you know, even the whole thing about you've got everybody there. Yeah, you may do, but you just simply have not got time. I miss somewhat the anonymity. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point, yeah. Like being able to kind of just obscure your badge as you're walking past somebody and go like, oh, it's interesting that they have a booth here and those guys are over there. Uh, maybe I'll change the way I'm thinking about this particular company. But not having to basically share that thought process that I just had with them is a, ma is a major thing, right? So like the problem is, is that I don't, I don't necessarily want that company to think that I'm interested in them right yeah, now yeah, because yeah. then I get inundated with uh, cold sales calls that I don't want that are that are coming at me at a time that I don't want to consider it. Yeah, sorry, then, Grant, I've, I've taken you off our uh, list now. I do apologize. No, I'm just saying you. You know, you, 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 as the as the as a vendor, run the risk of of putting me in a position where. I'm already, I already don't like you and pissed off at you because of the way that you approached me yeah. after having been given a, 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 a non-targeted uh, kind of introduction, right? Um, and, and you've lessened the likelihood that I ever do business with you because you, you've been off-putting to me in the way that you were, for, were forced to approach me, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. finding a way to introduce folks out in you know in the technology vendor land to to people that are spending on their services but have the people that are spending on their services not have to completely give out all of the information about what they're looking at while they're browsing the floor if you will you know what i mean i think you yeah, would have enjoyed the dpp pitch event there was a section on data management and there's all sorts of different um sort of pitches and there were 10 companies doing three minutes each and you they pitched and you just you voted which ones you wanted to get in touch with afterwards, right? And it was it was pretty innovative and it and it worked. And we've got um we've got a lead out of it and hopefully it's gonna turn into a customer. So the one thing I do miss about trade shows and you know, trade shows as a vendor, you go, you arrange your meetings or you don't go. If you haven't got arranged meetings, no point going. But you do get those glorious walk-ons that do turn into deals occasionally. And it's like those are the bits that you remember about trade shows. It's the guy that came on when we had a Welsh male voice choir playing and, and stopped because of that, looked at a sign, and then we had a built a relationship. That's the bizarrely brilliant bit about trade shows that yeah. we won't do for a while. Ultimately, trade shows have to turn into this, like this, ha have to turn into a data sharing platform mm -hmm. that allows everybody to kind of control which bits of data they share with each other at which time, you know. I think one other comment that, that Josh made, which ultimately has to have a bearing on on trade shows and, and everything else is that you know if 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 you have this virtualized infrastructure with with um i won't use the word term microservices but at least um uh components that you can easily chop in and chop out and, sw and switch as you need to um there's a kind of there there has to be a question about whether the the relationship really maintains at that point right 
I've heard many, many people talk about this thing, and it's just such total nonsense. It's like, you, you, yes, you can swap things in and out. Great. But it's like, has anyone been through the whole thing of um, you swap your transcoder and you have to revalidate your um, your output with Sky for six months? Um, it just it just does not That's work. And I wish we'd stop pretending it does. Because let's face it, I've been pretending about that kind of stuff for um, for years, as, as Nick, Nick knows. But from a pragmatic perspective, I think you... I mean, sorry, I, I, sorry, but I think you, your point is actually a very good one. The, the, you, the, you, you, know, you, you do have to have that... Uh, you know, the, the API doesn't replace the personal relationship. But you know, we, we've got to get away from this idea that the industry is going to, it, is, is going to be Lego blocks, because it just isn't. It's nonsense. Well, someone has someone has to explain to your client why those Lego blocks didn't work as advertised and stand right. there. Yeah. I, I think that'd be a, a cracking topic for another podcast, though. Is it Lego <laughs> blocks or not, right? right. But, uh, but 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 there is a certain amount of commoditization in the industry, and and, and you you do have to wonder at which point some of the services or things that we consume um, as part of the supply chain there is less interaction. And I think Ben, to your point, we should do something on uh, interoperability and that because. Um, We've we we've been doing lots of work against the S3 standard, right? Which is not a standard at all. And yet everyone says, "Oh, we talk S3." Well, there's like 15 different SDKs, JDKs, different IDs. You you can't plug S3 into one platform and expect it to work in another platform, right? Because people use it differently. And so until this industry decides on having standards in in metadata or um, object storage or cloud access. You ain't ever going to just do um, commenting in and out, ever, ever, ever. And I am 20 plus years in both NAB, IBC, and there are relations. You get your continual check jobs. I mean, I joke that, that my industry in the U.S. anyways is like 3,000 people in a liberal arts college spread across the country who all rotate to, from one company to the next. <laughs> but to Grant's point, it's an entire art form. I like the spy versus spy and miss that part. Then you play the game of watching your competitors, which you can't see virtually easily, and seeing which you know projects have been worked on. But very importantly, seeing where your clients are going, because they can't really hide when they're on the floor. And you see them standing at that booth versus the other booth. And that's also... <laughs> You know, old school harbinger on where is that project and how real is that project yeah, yeah, yeah. and what are you up against it? Yeah, you know, I mean, and that and there's a lot and there was a certain level of uh, gamesmanship to all of that. You know, and yeah. we would sit and you'd send people over to competitors and badges would be changed or get consultants to come by and try to pick apart who's saying what or attend a different panel and yeah, it's all part. It's all part of the given in this virtualized webinar. Which will not, I mean, if you, we're going to hold this to keep people's interest over the coming years, uh, ew, that's going to be a tough one. All right. Is that or for the death of trade shows? I'm going to say yes. Brilliant. Wow. That was a really good conversation. And it looks like overall we have a split vote from the group with two brilliance for Devoncroft conclusions and two busts. Ooh, nobody likes a draw. What are we going to do? <laughs> well, we did say we weren't allowed to sit on the fence. This is true. So I think given that we love the work that Josh and Joe do, uh, although we don't agree with everything they've said in these series, I think we should vote for them to take a brilliance out of this situation. Definitely. One big brilliant for Devon Croft overall. But I was really surprised by a couple of comments today, and I'm also definitely going to follow up with this group on the suggestion that we talk more about interoperability and argue probably a lot about whether different kinds of media technology will ever work and fit together as reasonably as a bunch of Lego blocks. Yeah, I think that people are finding out that it doesn't work exactly as it says on the tin. So it's a fantastic conversation we should absolutely have. I think one of the Big things to come out of this podcast for me today, though, is that Josh needs to put his hands in his pockets and buy Ben that breakfast pretty damn good. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much to everyone who joined us today. Uh, we really appreciate your time and your thoughts. We'd love to continue the conversation with our listeners on the WIG LinkedIn group. So if you're not a member, go over and sign up. It'd be great to get your feedback, comments, and questions from anything we've discussed today or any suggestions for future podcast series. So yeah, please do get in touch. Great, thanks Nick, and we'll see you next time. What about? Today's Wig Talks Brilliant or Bust podcast was sponsored by Vidispine, 
cloud-based media workflow solutions to maximize your media potential. Zixi, the global leader in broadcast quality live video over IP. Object Matrix, the cloud storage people who provide platforms that enable creative and production teams with self-serve access to media content on-premise or remotely from anywhere. Today's contributors were Hawkthorn Innovation, helping bring the power of modern artificial intelligence and the cloud to bear on story production, content supply chains, and media systems integration. And Christy King LLC, a media technology consultancy and content creator.